Mm, great. That's cool. We have 38 as far as I can see here. Wow. That's nice. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think? Should we get started? I, I think so. What do you think? Uh, I, I didn't hear you. Did you say I think so? Yeah. Okay. You didn't hear me? No, you're, um, there was like, uh, 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 mm, 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 okay, and you know? why now? Now it's fine. Now it's okay. Hi, Andrea. Thais. Um, okay, so I guess we'll start. Mateus, uh, do you want to check your audio before, before I go or it is okay? So, like, can you say, hear me well? Say something. Yes, yes. Okay. Fine. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Adriana Kirsten de Langello, a uh, professor at PG, PPGI and at UPSKI. And uh, I can see many familiar names here. So, Thank you all for being here. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you today, and especially to be talking about a subject that I feel so enthusiastic about. And above all, uh, I, it is a great pleasure to be delivering this presentation with Mateus, who is officially my advisee, but who is in fact a peer with whom I have the opportunity and the satisfaction actually to grow professionally because we do exchange lots of ideas and experiences both about sociocultural theory and about teacher education. So um, I am very grateful to be here with you, Mateus. Thank you. Do you want to introduce yourself before yes, I start? Yes, yes, yeah? yes I will. Okay. So, mm -hmm. my name is Mateus Andrea Guinoleto. I am a second year doctoral student at Programa de Pós-Graduação em Inglês at Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. And I've been Professor Adriana's advisee since I wrote my undergraduate thesis. So, I think we can call it a long term relationship by now. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to first of all thank everyone for being here with us. I also want to thank our program, PPGI, for supporting us with the event. And special thanks to Harissa, who has helped us set up all the technological stuff here. So thank you very much, Harissa. And of course, yeah. my dear advisor and professor, Adriana, for the opportunity once again to be talking about something that I adore so much with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. so. Uh, after this thankful note, uh, Harissa, also, uh, I want to thank you too. I'm sorry that I forgot to say it before, but Mateus did it, so I, I think it's fine. Okay, so shall we start? Um, our talk today is entitled Clearing Up Some Misconceptions of Vygotsky's Sociocultural Theory. And the idea of giving this talk was the increasing number of Vygotskyan studies today. And of course, the fact that there are some misconceptions, some common misconceptions about sociocultural theory. So here's the outline of the presentation. The slide, Mateus, okay. please. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll start by giving a quick overview of some main constructs of sociocultural theory, namely mediation, zone proximal development, internalization, and Perichuveni. Then we'll briefly walk you through Vygotsky's view on human cognitive development, and then we'll get into the gist of this presentation that are the misconceptions themselves. Uh, so, in that regard, we'll talk about the role that Vygotsky 
attribute to biological factors in human mental development. We'll try to clean up the mass around the concept of ZPD, fresh and cyclist one construct, and scaffolding. And we'll, we'll address imitation as an indispensable mechanism that enables internalization, embracing the role of learners in cognitive development. We'll then bridge, I mean, if there is time, we, and, and we can do it at the end, we'll bridge this presentation to teacher education, which is uh, the main research interest that we have as researchers. Okay, so let's start with mediation, the, the main constructs, right? So mediation is very um, famous, let's say, is, is people talk a lot about mediation when it comes to Vygotsky, right? So this is one of the most basic claims that Vygotsky raises. Um, and what he says is that our relation with the world is mostly indirect or mediated. He says that humans have a mediated mind. This is to say that human activity and thinking are mainly mediated, which happens by means of either physical tools or psychological tools. An example of a physical tool is the shovel, for example, that digs a hole, or a pen that puts ideas to paper. As for psychological tools, language is the most pervasive one. It is by means of language that humans become humans, that they interact, we interact, that we understand, and feel the physical world, the social world, that we organize our cognitive processes, that we share knowledge, learn, and develop. So Vygotsky actually said, and I am quoting him now, that every child, every function in a child's cultural development appears twice. First, on a social level, and later on, in, uh, later on at an individual level. So that means to say first between people, interpsychologically, and then inside the child, inter, intra-psychologically. So basically, this is what mediation is about. Now, uh, another main construct of Vygotsky's theory is the zone of proximal development, which according to Lentov and Thorne, is the most widely used and yet least understood of the central concepts of sociocultural theory. And this is why one of the misconceptions we'll be dealing with today involves the ZPD. The ZPD is the difference between the actual developmental zone and the potential developmental zone. So it characterizes mental development prospectively. It is a metaphoric space of potentiality as Johnson and Golombek say, say. Now this potential level of development uh, is then what can be achieved with the help and guidance or guidance of others, more experienced others. Development within the ZPD requires mediation that is responsive to learners' needs, meaning that mediation must be contingent on one's readiness to learn. I cannot, for example, try to teach organic chemistry if you don't have any basis of chemistry itself, right? So that is uh, the ZPD. We have to know what the ZPD of the students are 
so that we can mediate them responsively, meaning mediate, um, provide mediation that is directed at their needs. Okay? So um, the next construct that is central to Vygotsky's sociocultural theory is internalization, which according to him is the internal reconstruction of an external operation. This means to say that it represents the incorporation of external activities and cultural tools into the individual's mental processes. At this point, it is useful to bring the quote that I uh, made as I was talking about mediation back here. Every function in a child's cultural development appears twice. First on a social level and later on an individual level. First between people, interpsychologically, then inside the child, intrapsychologically. Internalization, however, is not a process whereby the external is merely duplicated into the internal plane. The process, this process is transformative. That means that as one incorporates the, inter the external world, one does it in a way that suits them that goes in accordance with their mental image of the original. Apart from that, imitation is intentional. Imitation for Vygotsky is intentional, goal-oriented, and entails cognitive activity. And this is Lantoff and Thorne again. Now, the last concept that we consider key to Vygotsky's theory is Perichevani, which has to do with how one becomes aware of and interprets and emotionally experiences a certain event. Um, this is to say that cognition is not shaped by what is out there, but rather by how one emotionally experiences what is out there. For Vygotsky, cognition and emotion come hand in hand. The crux of development is not the social environment per se, but the relationship between the learner and the social environment, which goes back to the transformative character of internalization that I mentioned before. So what one internalizes, as I previously said, is not a duplicate or a reflex of the external. It is a transformation or a refraction of the external. Okay, next slide. So based on these main constructs of the theory, if we are to answer how Vygotsky understands human cognitive development, we can say that it is a mediated process heavily dependent upon language and upon one's readiness to learn and socially originated, coming from the outside to the inside and as such also dependent upon external as well as internal factors. Verisov has a mantra that says, human minds are historically rooted, socially constructed, and culturally shaped. And that's, that is a mantra that we also have for ourselves when we work in our research within sociocultural theory. Okay. So am I, am I too fast? No. No? Okay. All right. So um, also Vygotsky claims that we develop due to the interplay between biology and culture. Biologically speaking, 
human beings are endowed with lower or elementary functions. And culturally speaking, they develop, they develop higher mental functions. Examples of uh, lower or elementary functions are involuntary attention, for example, turning heads when a door slams, involuntary memory, as when we suddenly remember something, and emotional release, right? Like screaming when feeling pain. These functions are originally biological, as previously mentioned, and characterized as being heavily influenced by the environment and also marked by the absence of conscious realization and no mediation, absence of mediation again also, all right? So for example, there are things like involuntary memory, there are things that we don't want to remember and we still do, right? We want to forget, but we can't. Um, things like uh, involuntary attention, for example, uh, there are moments in which I am, I don't know, let's say in class, and um, there is the, the teacher is explaining something, and I want to pay attention to the teacher, and I am voluntarily paying attention to the teacher, but then something happens, and I look, so it is a moment in which I do not consciously um, plan to do that, but I do it anyway, right? So those are examples of lower or elementary function. As for higher mental functions, those have social origins. They originate from one's participation in sociocultural activities, as well as with culturally constructed artifacts. They are controlled by the individual who consciously realizes them. So examples of higher mental functions are voluntary attention. What is happening now? I want to pay attention. For example, you decided to pay attention to me now, and you are paying attention. So that is voluntary attention. There's also voluntary memory, which is the deliberate recall of the past. So you, you stop and think, oh, when was that now we were talking to Cynthia? When was the last time that we met? Oh, that was in July. Oh, it was in Victoria in the, in the conference. Oh yeah, it was. So we recall that deliberately, deliberately, voluntarily. And also using language for communication. This is also something that I do because I want to, right? For example, if I want to scream to warn someone they are in danger, right? Um, there, there is an example, I guess it is in Marta called de Oliveira, Marta calls book, in which she, she gives an example of, um, I don't remember the animal, that the animal screams and, uh, and then sometimes people may think that the animal screaming to let his uh, peer uh, animals know that they are in danger, but actually what is happening is that the animal is just feeling um, fear and then he screams, right? So these are the main uh, constructs of sociocultural theory. And as this is not our focus today, I just uh, very briefly talked about each of them, especially these four that we selected for today's presentation. Of course, there are lots of other um, concepts that Vygotsky has in the theory, but these are the ones we selected, especially because we think they are important for, uh, for the talk that we're having 
about these misconceptions, okay? Um, so let me tell you that, I, I don't know if you have heard about Perichuveni before. Perichuveni is, is a construct that Vygotsky talked about, that Vygotsky gave attention, but only in the last, I don't know, 10 years, and now uh, even more, maybe in the last five years, even more. Um, not five, but seven, eight. Um, we've been talking in the, here in the Occident, uh, we've been talking about Perichiveni a bit more. So Mateus is going to talk more about this later, right, Mateus? So I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not going deeper into it because he will. All right, now, uh, going on, we now turn our attention to the misconceptions themselves. And the first misconception is that Vygotsky does not attribute to bi biological factors a role in human development. So this is not true. Biologically endowed elementary functions, those that we just commented on, or lower mental functions, are natural. They are in it, and therefore unlearned capacities. These are functions that humans share with primates, for example. These are functions that do not depend upon learning. And Vygotsky's focus was on learning, on learning and development. So he did not study lower mental functions. He focused on higher mental functions. But he did recognize the importance of biology in mental ability. The lower mental functions are actually, he considers, the foundation of the higher ones, he claims. And actually, sociocultural theory, which lies its basis in dialectics, presupposes a bidirectionality between biology or nature and human behavior. A bidirectionality in which on the one hand, natural endowments form the foundation for thinking. And on the other hand, higher mental functions transform elementary functions by bringing them under the control of the person. So you may, for example, consciously avoid involuntary memory. That one that may be evoked without conscious effort or involuntary behavior that comes under your control. So let's say um, you, every time you go into an uh, elevator, a lift, you panic. There are people who feel that. I don't know why. <laughs> but <laughs> that's me, guys. Uh, but, and, and this is involuntary. So this, these are my lower mental functions working, right? So I panic when I go into an elevator. But if I am pretty sure, I was told already, and I believe it, that if I take the time to go to a therapist, and talk about it and try to understand what happened, I will be able to have control of myself and stop panicking, right? I did not do it yet, but I'm pretty sure that I can, right? So this, in, in this sense, there is this bidirectionality that we mentioned. Higher mental functions and lower mental functions, they feed each other, right? So we cannot say that Vygotsky uh, downplayed biological factors. He just did not focus on them. He did not um, uh, study them because what his interest was in learning and development, right? So, um, 
if if we if we get if we get for example um behaviorism or inatism they assumed an unidirectional relationship between behavior and nature right because humans they believed were are the way they are either because of the environment or because of their bi biological makeup but not due to the interaction between one and the other right so there is not this bidirectionality that there is in the god piece okay now um going to the next mis misconception misconception I believe that we get into one of the most popular constructs of Vygotsky, which is the ZPD, which is also many times misunderstood. Um, the ZPD is at times taken as visible to integration with Crescent's I plus one construct, and at times, and very, very often with scaffolding, right? So let's start with ZPD comparing by comparing the ZPD and Crescent's I plus one. Defining the two constructs, we have already seen that the ZPD is the distance between actual developmental level uh, as determined by independent problem solving. So this is what I can do. I am independent in a given development, uh, a given knowledge, let's say. And the level of potential development as determined through problem solving under adult guidance or expert guidance or in collaboration with more capable peers, right? So this is what the ZPD is about. Now, Crescent I plus one construct claims that humans acquire language in only one way, by understanding messages or by receiving comprehensible input. And this comprehensible input has to contain structures at our next Page. So structures that are a bit beyond my current level of competence. This is what I can do, right? And there is the language acquisition device, which is what enables learners to act upon and assimilate this received comprehensible input, right? Now, both theories therefore project the future, right? And this is possibly what might have led people to equate the two theories. But let's see how the future figures in each theory. The ZPD claims that good learning is that which is in advance of development. The I plus one construct states that good learning results from good input, which is input that contains linguistic structures that are slightly beyond one's current linguistic competence. Now, the ZPD has to do with one's immediate future and their dynamic developmental state, attending to both what has already been developmentally achieved and for what is in the course of maturing. While the I plus one also takes into account one's immediate future, but attends to the acquisition or not of a specific structure, right? No attention is given to what is about to come. So for Vygotsky, um, the ripening process is central and development depends on one's maturing needs 
as well as on cultural and historical influences. And Crash and Cyclus 1 formula does not represent what is under development, but what will be acquired next. And the movement from one state to the next is fixed and predictable, right? And Vygotsky, you don't have such predictability, okay? So the similarities as done in lentils pose are superficial, but the differences are profound. And as can be noticed in their views of learning and development, Vygotsky holds that learning and development are dialectically related, forming a unity in which the former paves the way for the latter, which in response fosters further learning. As for language learning, it arises in the coming together of people with identities and histories. So it is in this coming together that people learn and develop and with people and these people having identities and histories and culture. And it is in the midst of this social interaction that learning and development take place. And uh, language is acquired through the activity of making meaning. Crashing says learning and development, or rather acquisition, because it does not talk about development, as separate phenomena, as learned competence does not become acquired competence. This is something that Krashen says. What is learned is learned, what is acquired is acquired, right? One does not uh, turn into the other. The real ca cause of language acquisition remains comprehensible input. As for language learning, it occurs invisibly inside someone's head. So basically, this is the difference between Vygotsky, uh, Vygotsky ZPD and Crescent's I plus one. Um, you might, I, I cannot read what you're, what you're uh, writing at the moment, but um, uh, we will have time for questions and answers later. So please uh, hold your questions that we will answer them later, okay? So now we'll be talking about the difference between the ZPD and scaffolding, and I give the floor to Mateo, who will continue. Okay, just give me a second here, please. Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Yeah, 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 right. What? <laughs> No, 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 no. I, I thought it was not, that was not yet the, the next slide, but it is. Okay, yes, it is. I, mm -hmm. just had a, I just had an issue here. Just give me a moment, please. Okay. Do you need any help? No, no, I think it's, okay, it's working. Okay. Okay. So my turn. Thank you, Professor mm -hmm. Dan. Thank you, Matthew. So basically, uh, now we move on to the misconception uh, to the origins of the concept of scaffolding, right? And the idea that zone of proximal development and scaffolding mean the same thing. Uh, so basically, I just like to start off by saying that much research has attributed uh, scaffolding to Vygotsky, but in fact, uh, he did not, he just mentioned it uh, in a publication he had with Luria in 1930, once when he was in the instrumental psychology phase of his work, which is the first phase of his work. And it was when he was trying to look for a name to his approach and in the middle of that he mentioned the, the, the concept of scaffolding, not the concept, the word scaffolding once, but he's not, he wasn't even talking about zone of proximal development or he was talking about mediation. So there's this just one mentioning of scaffolding in his whole work, right? 
And uh, uh, what is interesting about this is that there is no consensus about how the term has become popular in sociocultural theory, but some speculations point to the uh, cognitive psychologist Brunner, okay? Basically, rumor has it that since he was friends with Luria, he ended up spreading the concept of scaffolding like after reading Vygotsky's and Luria's work and relating it to Vygotsky to sociocultural theory. But it is not something that Vygotsky coined like this is scaffolding and I use it this and this and that way. <clears throat> so moving on, uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some differences between the concept of zone of proximal development and scaffolding. Uh, so the first one is that when it comes to the ZPD, we have to remember that it's a metaphorical space, what Professor Adriana mentioned before, right? It is a space between the actual and the potential levels of development that has this potential to propel development if mediation is provided. And when it comes to scaffolding, we have this idea of any type of adult child or expert, no, novice, expert, learner, okay? Interaction in which the adult expert aims to assist the child's performance. Performance, I'm sorry. So in this case, we have this metaphorical space that comes to exist between other two developmental levels, okay? So the focus is on development and on the other hand, with scaffolding, we have any type of interaction that is focused on assisting one's performance during a specific task. The next point is about the quality and quantity of mediation or assisted provided. When it comes to the zone of proximal development, there's this idea of quality of mediation, which is dialectically negotiated between expert and novice, and this quality of mediation is the driving force of human development. And when it comes to scaffolding, this is thought of in terms of the amount of assistance provided and its quantity that is emphasized. And this quantity is based on experts' decisions, leaving little space for the learner's creativity. So what does this mean, quality of mediation? In few words, it means that novice and expert build up zones of proximal development as they interact during social interaction. And the way the novice responds to the expert during interaction shapes how mediation should take place, shapes the quality of this mediation. And when it comes to scaffolding, the idea of the dialectical relationship between expert and novice expert learner is not at the center of interaction. And quantity is emphasized over quality of okay. mediation for ZPD and assistance for scaffolding. Moving on, when it comes to the ZPD, we have internalization, the idea of internalization of physical and psychological tools being necessary for development to take place. And these tools are the means through which mediation is enacted. Right? And then, uh, uh, as opposed to that, uh, scaffolding, when we talk about scaffolding, there is this loose link to the concept of uh, cultural tools. Next one, this is very important. So, for Vygotsky, for, zone of for the zone of proximal development, I'm sorry, there is this focus on long term developmental process. So, as I said before, the focus is on the process of development. And when it comes to scaffolding, we have this high focus on the product. That is to say, the, usually uh, in class, the completion of a task, right? So this is very important when we discuss the differences between these two concepts, uh, because Vygotsky's focus was always on the process, on development, rather than on the outcome, on the result, right? So, uh, this is something that um, people should, we should take into account when thinking about the differences between these two concepts. And last but not least, as Adriana mentioned before, uh, when it comes to the ZPD, it is dynamic and unpredictable, right? And then when we talk about scaffolding, it is a mechanical metaphor, 
and it supposes a predefined system of goals. So once the PD changes during the course of development, and this change needs to be constantly assessed and accessed first and assessed by expert others or the expert other that needs to provide mediation that is responsive, that is directed to this, uh, to these lear to this learners, I'm sorry, need, right? And while for scaffolding, there is already a desired outcome, if we think about classes, for example, there is already a desired outcome from the very beginning. So the system of goals is pre-established. Therefore, it is not unpredictable as the ZPD is. It is predictable. <clears throat> so now, um, when thinking of the literal meaning of scaffolding, Professor Adriana and I were discussing some factors that make this metaphor, the word scaffolding, uh, incommensurable with uh, the concept of ZPD. And then we came up with these ideas in the blue box. So basically, when, 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 when we look at this picture, right, there is a building under construction literally being scaffolded. Then we came up with this idea. So the first one, here we have a specific result is aimed right, is aimed at from the very beginning. What does this mean? So if you look at the building's floor plan, for example, we already have a good idea of how it'll look like at the end, right? The second point, uh, it is a stable and static structure. So each level, each floor being very similar to one another. So therefore, this is highly predictable, right? So each specific part, goal is pretty similar. So this making the process of constructing the building rather uh, similar and predictable. The next, uh, it supports the construction of the building, the scaffolding. Uh, so the focus is on product and it's external to the individual, right? And this is very important when you think of the zone of proximal development, the focus is on the individual's developmental process. It's internal to the individual. And last but not least, it allows the workers, the scaffolds, right, to construct the building. The scaffolds allows, allow workers to construct the building. But then you were thinking, what changes do the workers themselves go through during the process of constructing a building, for example, as in this analogy? So it, it does not seem like a two-way street as the developmental process that takes place during the ZPD that the Gatsky claimed for. So both the internal and external worlds interacting and changing when it comes to the ZPD. And this does not seem the case when it comes to the word, the concept, not the concept, but the, this metaphor of you know, the word scaffolding itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> So moving on, so here I'm just, we're just trying to sum up very briefly what we've discussed so far, okay? So basically, uh, we should just remember that Vygotsky's work focused on first language development, right? And then his work has been extended to different areas by many different researchers in second language acquisition. For example, we have Lento, Thorn, right? And Poner. And so uh, in SLA, it has been, um, equated, right, with the I plus one construct and scaffolding by some uh, people, by some scholars. So basically, just to sum up, when it comes to the ZPD, it's a Vygotskyan concept. It's about pros prospective mental development. So learners maturing capabilities, there's this focus on these maturing capabilities. Uh, this focus on the dialectical collaborative activity between a learner and expert. It is highly unpredictable and learning and development are dialectically related. When it comes to the I plus one construct, uh, so it was coined by question, okay? There's the whole idea of the comprehensible input that is the real cause of second language acquisition. And the I plus one construct, we have the idea that the current linguistic competence plus what comes next along the natural order of acquisition, right? If this is what matters. 
so we have this natural order of acquisition pre-established, so being predictable. And we have the idea of a passive body being exposed to input. And finally, when it comes to scaffolding, we know it's pretty much related to second language acquisition, like we've all read something about that many times, right? And so there is no consensus regarding its origin. Uh, so we know it's not a Vygotskian concept, but then there was this idea of like Brunner, like kind of making it into a Vygotskian concept, but we don't know in fact if he was yeah. the one. There are just some speculations. Uh, so there is no consensus regarding the concept itself. Some people equate it to uh, the, the CPD. People talk about it when uh, they write, they research on tutoring, right? And uh, it's more closely linked to problem solving situations rather than development. And just on a personal note, this is one of the most striking differences between the CPD and scaffolding. So the next, which is one of my faves, uh, is the misconception that imitation, as in behaviorism, paves the way to internalization. So to start off, I would just like to go back to the idea of the very important and famous genetic law of cultural development professor Adriana mentioned before, which uh, Vygotsky claimed that every higher order psychological function appears twice. So first on the social level and later on the individual level. That is to say first between people interpsychological and then inside the child, the learner, intrapsychological, as Professor Adriana mentioned before. So basically here he's talking about internalization, right? So highlighting his claim that human mental development has its origins in the social, so as to later on become internalized by the individual. And according to Lentov and Thorne, uh, internalization is the mechanism through which control of our natural mental endowment is established. And this is very important. It goes hand in hand with externalization. So it's not a one street process. So Vygotsky believed that internalization and externalization formed an inseparable unity. So it's a process that is um, co-constructed both on the intermental plane and on the intramental one, right? And briefly speaking, what happens is that during one's developmental process, they do not just sit back and listen to what is being talked about or what's being taught to them, right? They rather, they interact with this external reality, this external reality being objects and other people and concepts, right? by externalizing what they think of what's being discussed, by externalizing their needs, that is to say, by responding to such a reality. <clears throat> and again, as Professor Diana mentioned before, what becomes internal in this process is not a mere duplication of the external, and it is the result of the dialectical relationships established between the individual and the collective worlds. And about these uh, two uh, last topics, I will talk a little bit more about them in on a slide to come. Uh, so basically what's important is that it's through this very process of internalization that the reorganization of person environment relationships um, takes place. So moving on, uh, according to Vygotsky, the process of internalization consists of a series of transformations, these being uh, an operation that initially represents an external activity is reconstructed and begins to occur internally. An interpersonal process is transformed into an intrapersonal one, that is to say from intrapsychological to intrapsychological. And the transformation of an interpersonal process into an intrapersonal one is the result of a long series of developmental events. And then we chose this picture of the little girl speaking in order to try to illustrate this in a very simple and just to give you an idea of how this works. So basically when acquiring and developing, when developing, I'm sorry, their first language, uh, children first encounter the fully developed uh, language in the adult speech around them, right? And this is external to them. So as they grow older and 
keep interacting with these external world, this being concepts, adults, objects, right? They internalize, okay, language that at the beginning was exclusively used by the adults around them, uh, which becomes a means for communication between children and the adults around them, as well as a means for organizing and regulating their own children's own thinking activity. So as I just mentioned, this depends on a long series of events, like for example, when children develop their understanding of specific objects and learn their names, when meaning is attributed to adults' actions, uh, when children discover that each thing has its own name in the world, right? And according to Vygotsky, here we have the, the very controversial part, this happens through imitation, right? And now we have a special guest, Nazare is a little bit confused because imitation, she might think, how come this is not behaviorism? I like memes, so I'm sorry about that. So let's try to clear this up a little bit. Uh, so uh, basically, Vygotsky says that a person can imitate only that which is within their her developmental zone. So our imitative capacity is tied to our zones of proximal development. And Vygotsky also says that it is through imitation that we can do more in collective activity than what we would do on our own. And this uh, very important distinction that Lindhoff and Thorne in 2006 made between imitation, emulation, and mimicry uh, uh, help explain this difference between Vygotsky's view of imitation and this behaviorist view of it. So uh, in Vygotsky's work, according to Lintop and Thorne, uh, imitation does not carry this behaviorist meaning. Why? Because according to them, imitation to Vygotsky means that the individual understands the goal and the means. This is very important. So the result, the goal, and the means, how I'm going to read something, through which the activity is carried out. When we go to emulation, we have the idea that the individual only understands the goal, but they don't understand the means that they can use to get that goal and the relationship between these means. And then, last but not least, mimicry, the individual neither understands the goal <clears throat> I'm sorry, nor the means to reach the goal, right? So in this case, I think that when we think of imitation, we have more often than not the idea of emulation and the idea of mimicry in mind. <clears throat> sorry. So we, uh, with this slide here, we try to illustrate how this can happen, right? So basically, I'm going to talk about sociodramatic play, which is basically when children play school and play firefighter, when they play the police, when they play, you know, like role play. Uh, so here in this, in this picture, we have children playing school, okay? And uh, as in any sort of school, there are different social roles people play right, as in real life. So there is the little boy playing the teacher, the teacher, and the three children playing students. So they all uh, act in different ways, they behave in specific ways, and they interact with one another and with objects in specific ways, right? So, and how do they know how to do that? So because they have seen it before, they need to have seen it before to be able to imitate it, right? So according to Karpov, children imitate real life, these social roles that they observe around them and behaviors. And they have already had contact, of course, with those roles and behaviors to be able to imitate them. And when it comes to sociodramatic play, play to Vygotsky is very important. Uh, this is an important step in children's developmental process because this allows them to later on regulate their own activity. How come? because at the time they are playing, they are playing roles that are way beyond their real developmental levels. Like the little boy is not a real teacher that te teaches students. Those students are not real, real students, I'm sorry, of that specific teacher. So 
although it imitates real life, it's not real life. So in play, they can move beyond what they can do in the real world, in real life. And in this case, we can see uh, the sort of imitative activity Vygotsky talks about, right? So uh, children know the goal. They all know the goal, what they have. To, for example, one needs to play the teacher and the others need to play students. But at the same time, they need to know how to act to play the teacher and to play the students. So they need to behave in accordance with the way a teacher would behave for the little boy and in accordance with the way students would behave in the case of the other three kids that are sitting. <clears throat> and, oops, okay. And this discussion now takes us back uh, to the idea of internalization and takes us to the final <clears throat> misconception. The idea that I've heard that many times, learners have a passive role in cognitive development. So I, I don't know if you remember, but some slides ago, I told you we were going to get back to these very two points. So the first one is that what becomes internal is not a mere duplication of the external, and that internalization is the result of the dialectical relationships established between the individual and the collective worlds. But okay, but then, what is the role of the learner in this whole process, we may think? How is not he or she just a passive body being provided with mediation by an expert? So to try to answer that, we are invoking the concept of Perichveni, and I'm so sorry, this is a Russian concept. Perichveni is the way I'm going to pronounce it. It's the way we pronounce it in our study group, so. <clears throat> If somebody speaks Russian here, I'm so sorry. So Perichiveni was explored in the final phase of Vygotsky's work and he died pretty young, as you know. So this was not fully developed as most of his work, right? And he defined it as how someone becomes aware of, interprets and emotionally relates to a certain event, right? So here we have, as Adriana said before, this emergence of emotions and cognition to Vygotsky, these two aspects were inseparable. So he saw them as two inseparable units. That's why we have opted, as many other researchers have, to use the Russian word instead of the concepts of, some people say, emotional experience. Some people translate Perichideni into emotional experience. Some other people translate it into cognitive experience, but it's not exclusively emotional and it's not exclusively um, cognitive. It's uh, both of these things together because to Vygotsky, these things are inseparable. So that's why we decided to keep uh, the word, the concept Perichiveni in our presentation and in our work overall. So basically, if you look at this scheme here of the errors, uh, in the novices Perichiveni or learners Perichiveni and experts mediation, okay, it represents how they cognitively and emotionally, the, the, the novices, uh, experience the experts mediation. And this explains why people may see, may interpret, may understand the same situations in different ways. So this is this movement from the novice Perichiveni being externalized how this person is cognitively and emotionally experienced such an event. To the expert, it's uh, of extreme importance for the expert to provide a novice with a mediation that is responsive, that is directed at these, uh, these people, the, this, this novice's um, maturing needs, okay? So here we have this interplay between the external, the expert providing mediation, and the novice um, refracting, I'm going to talk about this later, refracting, interpreting this mediation in different ways, which informs again the expert mediation, which informs again uh, the novice's page of any, and this process goes on and on. So basically speaking, we always experience an external event through our own internal lenses, okay? 
So when these lenses that I put here, Perigiveni, are externalized, the expert can provide this sort of mediation, quality mediation, right, um, that we talked about before. And again, we have dialectics present in Vygotsky's work throughout all his work, which is very important. This process being not a one street, so it's just one informing uh, the other. Okay, and then once again, we go back to the idea of internalization and externalization, uh, right? Being uh, a unity, right, informing one another. And <clears throat> uh, we go back to imitation because when it comes to Perichiveni, we have this idea that it enables us to enact imitation in our own particular ways. So therefore, allowing us to internalize what we encounter in the external world in our own ways. And now we get to a very, it's a little bit difficult, but very important uh, part of uh, this concept of Perichiveni, because Vygotsky says that we don't internalize, what we internalize, in fact, is not a reflection. We don't, it's not reflected on us. It's rather refracted. But Mateus, why are there two cups and a picture of two cups here? So I'm going to explain it now. <clears throat> Basically, Vygotsky draws on the concept of refraction. It's from physics, right? To explain how we emotionally and cognitively relate to events. So if we think of the word, just think of the word reflection, for instance, okay? So if we imagine ourselves in front of a mirror, what we see in the mirror is the exact copy of ourselves. Nothing changes, only if we have a problem with the mirror, right? So, and this is not what internalization, as Vygotsky's claim, uh, looks like, happens, right? So when he brings the concept of refraction into the discussion, Vygotsky emphasizes that as the water here in this example uh, <clears throat> is doing, and the glass reflect, refracts, I'm sorry, they refract the light, okay? The water refracts the light, and this changes the way we experience, we see the wall behind the glass. So the wall is a little bit, the stripes are distorted, are different in a different direction, and the straw, okay, is crooked now, so it is this refraction of the water, okay, that makes this happen. And this is the same thing that Perici, what Perichiveni does, okay? So we refract what is around us through the water, through the Perichiveni, right? <clears throat> so we experience these things. He says that the Perichiveni is the prism through which we refract what is around us is a prism through which we refract everything we understand. We cognitively, this is very important, just remember, cognitively and emotionally understand what is around us. So summing up what we've discussed so far, um, we have to always remember that from a Vygotskyan perspective, cognitive development is a dialectical process. So both the novice and expert are actively engaged in this process. So we have both the internal, the individual, and the external place uh, in interaction. Uh, a Vygotskyan perspective on human development does emphasize the role uh, of the expert peer of the teacher uh, in guiding, in fostering, leading the development of the novice one, but at the same time, it does emphasize the active participation of the novice during this process, this interplay, remember, from be between internalization and externalization. And a Vygotskyan perspective sees uh, human language as the most pervasive and important means uh, during one's developmental process. So basically it is, as Vygotsky says, as the, at the same time, a unit, uh, a means for interaction and for thinking. So it allows us to communicate with other people at the same time that it allows us to understand and further understand what is around us. So we are heading to the end of our presentation. Now it's Professor Adriana's turn again, please. We can hear you. The mic's off.
on again. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me try. Can you say something? Hi, can you hear me? Mateus? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I can. All right. Um, so, this, this is just to basically sum up what, what we've said so far. Of course, very briefly. Um, so, there are things that will be left over, but anyway, the, the, kind of the gist of, of what we've uh, discussed today is that human mental development takes place due to the interplay between biologically endowed functions and culturally developed ones. Right, biologically endowed functions, the lower mental functions, and culturally developed ones, developed ones, which are higher mental functions. Um, the ZPD, the I plus one and scaffolding differ in many different terms, such as the authors who coined them, their conceptualization and focus. The CBD being the only one which is part of Vygotsky's work, even though we know that specialist scaffolding has been um, widespread in, in the literature uh, that brings Vygotskyan work. Um, Vygotsky's concept of internalization explains how what once was intrapsychological becomes intrapsychological, basically relying on the concept of imitation, not from a behaviorist um, perspective, but rather as a goal oriented and meaningful um, resource. Uh, and this concept of imitation explains how this internalization happens. And human development depends on the dialogic and dialectical relationships between an individual's internal world and the external world around them. Both novice and expert actively shaping how interaction takes place. And finally, to Vygotsky, we are, at the same time, individual and collective. We are collective if we think that learning and development are social processes, but we are, uh, but we are at the same time individual from the perspective of these perichivani that Matthias just mentioned, uh, that we interpret things and uh, experience things in our own ways, cognitively and emotionally uh, understanding things and feeling things. Um, so we are individual and collective at the same time. Okay. Um, now, I said I would be just bridging this to teach education, but I think it took like more than one hour yeah. so far, mm. so I think I won't do that. Uh, just say to you, to those who do not know us, that our area of research is basically teacher education and all the work we do with teacher education is by conducting microgenetic studies, um, which means that we look, we try to look at teachers as they are developing. We try to look at development as it unfolds um, through social interactions and mediation that we provide to teachers. And basically, that is pretty much it. Okay? 
Yeah, so here, so, if you can, if you want, you can scan and download presentation. We want to thank you so much for being here with us. Mm -hmm. And now um, I think there will be no questions or are there any questions? <laughs> right. Okay, let me just... Uh, hey, Melissa, how are you? I'm reading this now. Thank you, dear. Thank you for being here, for coming to see us. Uh, Adriana, um, can I stop sharing? I just, yes, yes, I believe so. Uh huh. Um, I just, oh, there's there's somebody here asking for the QR, co QR code again. Oh, Mateus. okay, I'm sorry. Just give me a okay. sec. Yeah. Thank you, Flavia. Now, let me, uh, while Mateus uploads the presentation again, um, let me go back to some questions that I read as Mateus was talking about uh, th those misconceptions. There was, there was Daniela saying, repeat the mantra, please. So the mantra is, human minds are historically rooted, socially constructed, and culturally shaped. They are, um, when we say that they are um, here, uh, human minds are historically rooted, um, socially constructed, and culturally shaped. So when we when we say that human minds are historically re rooted, we mean that we do not create things out of the blues. We uh, and we do not have, for example, in our work, we do not have teachers go through discovery learning. Rather, what we do is we bring to them what is already available in the history of humanity, right? This is what we do. It is socially constructed because it happens by means of social interaction, bearing in mind that learning occurs on the interpsychological plane before it moves into the intrapsychological plane. And it is culturally shaped in that uh, one looks at things from their own cultural perspectives, let's say. What, uh, so what makes sense in one setting may not make sense in another, right? So basically, that, that is what this mantra says. Now, I also read uh, Hakeo asking whether the question was, when, when your cheeks flush, if you get embarrassed, does that count? And then I believe the question was um, when we were talking about lower mental functions. If it was, yes, that is a lower mental functions. A function, it is something that we do not have control of, but we can, right? There are people, for example, who flush when they have a presentation at school, right? Kids, uh, children, um, teenagers, adults, right? They may, uh, they may flush, but they may um, get control over this feeling, this sensation, if they work on that, and if they use their higher mental functions to uh, control that. Um, Anna. Yeah. Huh? No, I was just going to say that there are even some yeah. people that, that blush because it, it is a sort of a, not everyone, there are in some cases, people have a hormonal dysfunction or something like that, and they have surgeries to correct that, to correct, no, to, to help them with that. Mm -hmm. Which is, which is, again, something of men, right? The surgery, yeah. higher bent to function. Uh -huh. Okay, good, Matheus. Now, Anna, Anna asked, learning is triggered by external factors, but development occurs by the interaction between external and internal factors? So I would say, no, I don't believe so. Um, there is, what is it, Matheus? 
Ah, I'm you're sorry, looking for the question? Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Now, um, Anna, I would say that no, one affects the other. Learning and development happen due to the interplay between uh, biology and culture, uh, between individual and collective. Um, so learning and development both um, both would um, would uh, would happen due to interaction between internal and external factors. That was your question, right? Now let me see what else I saw. Thais, Thais asked, are there levels of internalization? Um, Thais, let's let's say that uh, internalization is a process, right? And you go through this process of internalizing something, and there may um, we don't necessarily refer to that as levels of internalization, but we of course we do recognize that there are levels of internalization. That there is a process, and um, you you may be like in the, in the beginning of the process, you may be almost coming to uh, the internalization of your concept, and you may be uh, far from internalizing, or you may be closer to internalizing something. So it is a process, right? So, That's why we usually say, like, we can see that internalization has been taking place, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because, and also, there is something which is very clear for us, which, uh, which is like, it is also dynamic. Let's say that I have internalized something, um, and then somebody comes to me and asks, something that I think, well, but does, uh, does, that, does that make sense according to what I have in my mind? And then I think back, I, I bring everything back and I give a step backwards and I think again and I reconstruct my uh, understanding of that given thing and blah, blah, right? So it is not something that, okay, so it's internalized, period over, right? It's not something like that. You may go back and forth in this uh, learning and development and of course, internalization process, right? Um, and that's basically what I saw in the comments here. So now if there anyone else wants to, to ask something or Raquel, is it possible to illustrate the goals and means when it comes to imitation in the example of the kids playing teacher and students? Do you want to cover that, Matheus? Or? Yeah. Yeah. For example, when they were playing in terms of the goals, they want to play. The little boy want, wanted to play the teacher. That was his goal. Okay. And the kids, they wanted to play students. And the means are, for example, in the case of the little boy as the teacher, he needs to, I don't know, to tell students to do activities. He uses the chalk and the board, and he hands out activities for students to fill in and behaves like a teacher. And then when it comes to the boy, the, the students, I'm sorry. So the goals, the goal is to act uh, like students and the means is how they do it. So, so they see it, they are quiet or they interact with the teacher only when the teacher uh, asks them to interact. They have uh, notebooks in which they write on. They have to, I don't know, raise their hands if they wanna go to the bathroom and stuff like that. So those, those actions carried out by them. Okay, Thank you, Raquel. Raquel. Thank you for the okay. question. Okay, let me see. According to my understanding, ZPD is tightly linked to conceptual development, good. But at the same time, there's learning that doesn't necessarily lead to development of new concepts. Yeah, 
but it is also meaningful, necessary. Uh huh. Yeah. To talk about learning, learning the present simple, uh, that we can link to the idea, the concept that we have uh, of the present tense versus in Portuguese versus learning the present perfect, which is more different from the users we do in Portuguese to refer to the same ideas or even learning new words. My question is, do you think we could use the concept of CPD for these more superficial, non-conceptual types of learning as well? Um, I believe so. Mm -hmm. This has been in my mind lately. Yes, I believe so. Even, uh, um, yes, the, um, uh, the zona proximal development is, is uh, more tied to the development of concepts. The theory is actually more, more uh, related to the development of concepts, right? And as, as Mateo said, it, Vygotsky never dealt with second language learning, for example. Uh, but yes, I do believe that we have to um, that we can use the ZPD to understand uh, the kind of mediation that a certain student needs in terms of these more simple things. Yes, I believe so. Okay, Francisco said that he, he's got to go. Thank you, Francisco, for coming. Pleasure to have you here with us. What else? Okay, sure. All right, Any, anyone else? Thank you, Maria Esther. Wonderful talk, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I just wanna say thank you to Marcus. He's, he's watching us from the Netherlands, Adriana. Oh, really? Yay, yeah. Marcus, thank you. How's it going there? I saw him so comment been, here. We are worldwide, Mateus. <laughs> we are in the Netherlands. That's great. I know he's still here, but he commented here somewhere. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I guess that if nobody else has questions, then we'll stop, right? Cynthia, thank you, dear. Thank you for coming. Luana, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure, too. Bye-bye. Thank you.